I would like to introduce to you Mr. Ryan Coyle. I was brought up in a world where music was all around me. Everywhere I went, whether it was listening to classical music or jazz on my dad's stereo at home or listening to the car radio on the way to school, music was always flowing through my ears. As I got older, I started listening to music a lot more, to the point where I would listen to albums on end without stopping. At this point in my life, I realized how much I really appreciated music. I didn't actually realize the skills that these bands and singers had. As I admired the artists I was listening to, I started thinking, how? Not actually, how are they so good at playing their instruments, but instead, how does the music that we hear coming into our ears make that specific sound that we can define from any other? What characteristics make sound what it is? Hi, my name is Ryan Coyle, and welcome to my Masterworks presentation entitled The Sound of Music, an in-depth look into the physics and math behind music. Have you ever stopped to think about sound? You probably haven't. In fact, I hadn't thought about it much either before I started this project. Music enters your ears and you appreciate the sound that it makes and the beauty of the piece. And then the song is over and you move to the next one. What made your appreciation possible? Just think about it. The human voice. Perfect, unbreakable, natural. It just happens, doesn't it? Well, there has to be some explanation for this. When I started my project, I had no idea what I was getting into. I had kind of the mindset like, well, it just happens. But I found out that there are explanations for all things, and sound is no exception. All sound can be explained and calculated. So, what is sound? Let's find out. To start our journey, we're going to have to understand that sound is a wave. Start looking, okay, chances are that you probably have heard of the term sound wave. So, let me introduce you to it. These here, on the right, are sound waves. A, wa a sound wave is created by a vibrating object that sends a wave through a medium. For example, the vibrating object on a violin would be the strings. But in order for us to truly understand a sound wave better, we need to talk about the parts and characteristics of the sound wave. There are many parts of a sound wave that make them what they are, so let's dig right in. As I just previously mentioned, a sound wave is a vibration that passes through a medium. One of the things that helps us calculate the certain characteristics of the vibrations from the waves. We call these vibrations frequencies. Frequency is measured in Hertz, named after the 19th century German physicist Heinrich Rudolf Hertz, who proved the theory of electromagnetic waves. You may be familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum that shows the scale of light, but we won't be getting into that today. Anyways, Hertz are simply measured in vibrations per second. For example, if a sound is vibrating at one vibration per second, it will equal one hertz. The human ear is complicated, but it's a great detector that can pick up frequencies very quickly and precisely. Our ears are able to pick up frequencies as high as 20,000 hertz, or 20 kilohertz, and as low as 20 hertz. When a sound wave is lower than 20 hertz, inaudible to the human ear, we can call them infrasound, where any frequency higher than 20,000 hertz, or 20 kilohertz, is called ultrasound. Even though the human ear cannot detect sounds below 20 hertz, other animals can. An elephant, for example, can hear infrasounds as low as 5 hertz. Other animals, such as bats, can hear sound frequencies up to 120 kilohertz, and dolphins 200 kilohertz. So we know that sound is made up of vibrations, but frequency can be broken down into two types of pressures. These two components are high pressures and low pressures. High pressure waves are commonly referred to as compressions, whereas low pressure waves are commonly referred to as refractions. To explain how this, these things work, I will use this simple simulator. That's not, that's not, that's not the right one. Um, As you can see, there are some words here on the sidebar. You see frequency, which we've already talked about. We also have the period. The period is how long it takes for the wave to make one full cycle. So when I put the frequency to zero, my period is going to be infinity seconds, since there is no defined frequency. When I change the frequency, we start to see the sound wave take shape, 
and the period starts to decrease as the distance between each cycle lessens. Another thing here is the amplitude. If you can see, the amplitude here, um, when I change the amplitude, the wave gets smaller. And when I turn it up, it gets um, higher. When I'm doing this, I'm actually changing the volume of the sound. So when you're listening to music and you turn the volume up because you don't want to listen to people, you're actually manipulating a sound wave. All right, so let's get back to the compressions and uh, refractions. Rarefactions, it's a hard word to say. All right, so I'm going to go over to here. So as we can see here, um, since I have no frequency, nothing's moving. But these green dots here represent air molecules. And when I turn the frequency up, we can start to see them kind of moving around. They're kind of jumbled around, and they don't really have much order. But when I turn the wave amplitude up, we start to see them take shapes of compressions, and then in between, where it's less condensed, are the refractions. So when you turn the volume up, you're actually creating a bigger disturbance in the air particles. So far, we've talked about how a sound wave works. But what about music? Um, when you listen to people talking or vinyl on your record player, you're listening to complex analog waveforms. Analog is commonly referred to as pure sound. It's not altered or interrupted. But in today's world, we more commonly listen to digital waves instead of analog. Digital waves are copies of analog waveforms that have been digitized using a computer and compressed into a fraction of the data size. Information in the digital realm is stored in binary, which is a sequence of ones and zeros. The music contained in DVDs, CDs, MP3s, and MP4s are all examples of digital waveforms. MP3s are the most common thing that we now listen to. All of your music on your phone is stored as an MP3 or in a similar format. These files have been compressed from the original recording made in the recording studio. Compressing analog into digital is done by the ways of downsampling. Before we start to look at sampling, let's zoom in on the DVD. As I said, digital information is stored in ones and zeros. The information uh, that's stored in ones and zeros is visible on these disks with a very powerful microscope. As you can see here, the scale is one nanometer, which is very small. These dots and dashes that are in information on the disk um, are kind of like Morse code. They tell the disk reader um, what to do. So from this picture, we can see that the Blu-ray contains the most amount of information. With this in mind, let's go back to sampling. Imagine analog as a, piece, a sheet of paper. You can take a pair of scissors, cut it up, and place it back together. And essentially, it's still the same sheet of paper. But it doesn't have the fullness or the smoothness of the original paper. Sampling works in a similar way by taking multiple samples per second of an analog wave, squishing them, and then processing them through a device like a computer. Since analog is a pure wave, it's not cut up. While digital waves do have many samples per second, they lack the true sound of an analog file and are not a complete wave. Surprisingly, a lot of data is lost in digital sound. But it does take a lot more space to hold the information of an analog wave. In the music we listen to, a common sample rate can be 44,100 samples per second. Since these are measured in hertz, a common the common sample rate is then 44.1 kilohertz. But these are just samples. What actually connects them together? The answer is bit depth. This is getting a little bit tricky and technical. In order to explain sample rate a little bit better, I'd like to ask two volunteers to come up and help me. Um, let's see. Uh, Jackson Baker and Cameron Dugan. All right. So we're gonna, what we're going to do here is in front, in front, OK, well, whatever. It's all right. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do here is show you guys how sample rate works and where bit depth comes in. So Jackson and Cameron are going to be holding up uh, an example of an analog wave. What a computer does while sampling is it takes existing analog wave, an existing analog wave and cuts it up into samples like these.
Let's say this is a really high quality sound. Right now, you wouldn't really hear much as there's nothing connecting the samples together. That is where bit depth comes in, but I'll talk about that in a second. You probably can see the arc and, still see the, and say that you can still see the wave, but what happens when we take some of those samples away? We, look at, we find something that looks like this. Can you start to see the wave lose shape? At this point, the sound will have a lower sound quality. If we go further, the sound will have an even worse sound quality, like this. <laughs> um, I've exaggerated the samples a little bit, but this is to show you how the sound will be blocky, really harsh, and very unsmooth. Thank you, Jackson and Cameron. <laughs> But these are just samples. As I mentioned, there isn't really anything connecting them. You can't have digital sound without bit depth. The definition of bit depth is, in digital audio, bit depth describes the potential accuracy of a particular piece of hardware or software that processes audio data. In general, the more bits there are, the more accurate the resulting output from the data being processed. This may be a little bit hard to understand. So think of it like this. Think of it as a painting. If you have, say, two colors, the painting is going to be dull and lacking depth. But if you have a multitude of colors, it will be sharp, vibrant, and detailed. This is what it's like going from a low bit to a high bit depth. Um, let's say the bit depth is measured in samples as well. The amount of information in audio will be uh, the amount of samples per second multiplied by the bit depth. Retro games like Super Mario Land for the Game Boy Advance had 4-bit audio. This means that there is 2 to the 4 times the amount of samples per second. So 4-bit audio files have 16 samples per second. Now, we more commonly listen to MP3s, which are variants of 16-bit audio. It may not seem like that big of a step up from 4-bit, but since we're dealing with powers, 16-bit audio is a whopping 2 to the 16, or 65,536 samples per second. The bit depth limit doesn't stop there. However, even our earphones have the technology that can technically support 24-bit. So if we can use 24-bit, why don't we? Well, the information contained in 24-bit audio is a lot larger than that of 16-bit. In each second, there are 16,777,216 samples of information. At such a size, it would fill up the memory expandability of an entire phone with only an hour of music. So instead of just talking about digital audio sampling, let's test it. To see if the higher quality audio is worth the memory expandability, I got Rob Bailey, my external advisor, to take a piece of music and degrade the sample rate and bit depth. Let's see how it sounds. No, that way. Uh, so I'm going to play roughly 20 seconds of the same song at different sampling rates and bit depths. All right, this first one is a very good quality of the song. It's 96 uh, kilohertz with 24 bit. That is a lot of information. If you listen carefully, you can hear everything, all the, the, all the instruments, and instruments that are being played in the recording studio. Just note, this is a very, very high quality of sound. And you can really find these, you can only really find this quality of sound, in a sound with a sound engineer in their studio. We don't commonly listen to the sound quality. Now, let's move down a bit. Well, okay, let's move down a little bit more than a bit. Let's go down to 16-bit with 44.1 kilohertz. All right, it sounds the same, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. One thing to note is if you have a very good quality speaker or uh, really good headphones, um, you'll be able to tell the difference a bit more. But it sounds pretty similar, and this is because this is the common, uh, this is a common um, sampling quality that we listen to. 
Um, but let's keep going down. Let's go to 16-bit, 22 kilohertz. All right, it still sounds the same. <laughs> well, I mean, if you had better speakers, you could probably tell the difference a little bit more. But let's keep going down. This is still at 22 kilohertz, but down to 8-bit. It sound, still sounds the same. <laughs> to most of you. All right, let's just get down to the nitty gritty already. Staying in 8-bit, but going down to five kilohertz. This is mostly just to see the effect of what sampling is in music. You'll never have to listen to sound at this bad of a quality ever again. Well, after this. Okay. <laughs> if you're cringing in your seats, I don't blame you. You see, this is why the sample rate is very important. All right, we've talked about a lot of stuff surprising, but let's get away from the digital world. Let's head over to the good old stringed instruments. As I mentioned in my intro, sound can be calculated, but it seems almost impossible to express a note in a mathematical way. If it's just a note, can we actually explain it in a mathematical formula? Turns out that we can, and it might be easier to understand than you might think, with something as complex as a musical note. A harmonic is a note that when played on an instrument like the guitar has a clear and precise sound that you can hear differs from others. This is because it's a perfect ratio. A ratio in harmonic terms is a perfect multiple of the fundamental frequency, which is commonly an open string. For example, the G, D, A, and E strings on the violin, when played on their own, become the fundamental. But I'm going to stop myself there. We're getting a little bit in fast into this, don't you think? Well, how about we lighten up the mood a bit? Let's, I'm going to ask up my faculty advisor, Christian McInnes, and my awesome English teacher to play uh, some harmonics for you, and I'll explain what's happening. Thanks, <laughs> uh, all right. So let's take the A string on the guitar. This vibrates at 110 hertz. So as I said, since this is the open string, it's the fundamental frequency. Okay, we're all, where are all the other harmonics then? Well, on the string instruments, an octave will be a perfect fundamental, a perfect multiple of the fundamental frequency, creating a harmonic. So if the fundamental is 110, the first octave will be at 220 hertz. Can you notice that it's the same note? Except just higher. <laughs> awesome. All harmonics will go up according. All harmonic um, harmonics on octaves will go up according to this order. The next harmonic will be at 330 hertz. Yeah, octave. And the next will be at 440. But with the guitar, it's pretty hard to play this one. So, no. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. <laughs> When you look at a stringed instrument like the guitar, we can tell that um, a str the string is attached at either end. 
We know that a string vibrates when it's played, but at these two points, they don't really. These points in harmonic terms are called nodes. A node is a rest point where the vibrations are stopped or are significantly decreased. Therefore, an antinode is the highest point on the vibrating sting, uh, located in between the two nodes. As shown in the next slide, the fundamental frequency is in a full wavelength. A wavelength has met a completion when it has finished a full excursion into the positive domain and a full excursion into the negative domain, falling at the rest point or the zero crossing. Did you guys get that? All right. <laughs> well, this is just a fancy way of saying a period, which is why I explained before. All right. These are the waveforms for the harmonics on a stringed instrument like the cello. By looking at the first three harmonics, including the fundamental frequency, we can start to see a pattern. By going up in harmonics, we see that they gain a node and an antinode. They also gain half a wavelength. With this information, we can make an equation relating the wavelength to the string length. This picture shows the algebraic equation for the first four harmonics. If you take the first equation, which represents the fundamental frequency, we can see that L equals half A. L stands for the string length, whereas A stands for the wavelength. From this equation, we can see that the fundamental equals half the wavelength. So, now we know that harmonics are equal ratios. Let's see how we use them in instruments. All instruments play certain notes. Most instruments can play A through G and everything in between on the scale. But how do we know that our instrument is tuned in just the right way to play these specific notes? Some musicians can tune their instruments by ear, meaning that they can tell when the note is exactly right. But this takes a lot of practice, and it doesn't come very quickly to most people. Most classical instruments are tuned by the systems of just intonation. Just intonation is a system of tuning where the frequencies of the notes are related by ratios of the small whole numbers. This is a way for tuning uh, for most instruments. When I say this, I'm actually saying that um, the way these instruments are tuned is by their harmonics. As I mentioned before, harmonics are always successive intervals of the fundamental frequency. Harmonics are often described as perfect and crisp, so why would you tune into an instrument in any different way? <coughs> There are some instruments that don't use just intonation to tune, the most dominant, dominant instrument being the piano. The piano is one of the most expressive instruments with the most amount of playable notes. Since the piano is so versatile, it is used in helping create music through most digital systems. These are called MIDIs, or Musical in Instrument Digital Interfaces, and they're mostly what our music is made up of today in this highly digital musical era. All of these instruments, including the MIDIs, use equal temperament. But why don't we tune the piano using just intonation, if they are perfect ratios? The reason why piano and similar instruments don't use just intonation is simply because there are too many strings. After learning this, it raises some questions about the piano's tuning. Like, since it's not tuned in the same way as other instruments, is the piano inherently out of tune? Or, um, does it technically play different notes compared to other instruments as a result of its tuning? These questions are rather simple to answer, and we can even check our results using math to determine the correct solution. If you try tuning a piano by using harmonics the way other instruments are, you come to a very dissatisfying conclusion. If, for example, we take two notes on the piano an octave apart, according to just intonation, the second, one, the second note should have twice the frequency, two to one. And on the piano, it does. But harmonics are not the reason. For the fun of it, let's try and tune a piano using harmonic ratios. If we take, for, an exam for example, a major third, or five to four, and we times itself by three, which is the amount of major thirds in an octave, according to harmonics, we should come out with a frequency of two. This is the problem uh, that the piano encounters when you try t tuning it using harmonics. It doesn't equal two. In fact, 5 over 4, five over four to the 3 equals 1.9, 5, 3, 1, 2. Close, but not quite 2. You can try using whole steps, half steps, fourths, fifths, anything. But no matter what, you can't, use a, you can't tune a piano using harmonics. Equal temperament uses a mathematical expression to find the frequencies, just like just intonation. But we can't use perfect ratios to find these frequencies. So what mathematical expression do we use? In equal tempered tuning, we use the expression 12th root of 2 to find order frequencies. Now this seems strange, because the 12th root of 2 is a very small irrational number. So why would, we, why would this be the relation between notes on the piano? 
If you think of it, a piano has 12 keys in between octaves. So when you go up 12 keys, the, uh, fun the frequency will become 12 root of 2 to the power of 2, which equals 2, a perfect octave. However, the octave is the only perfectly tuned interval on the piano. Fifths are slightly flat, fourths are slightly sharp, major thirds are slightly sharp, minor thirds are slightly flat, and so on. Although the piano is the one of the most utilized instruments, you can always be sure that when you play a piano, or any musical instrument digital interface for that matter, it will always be equally and very, very slightly out of tune. So what? What has been the point of all this? Obviously, it's my masterworks, but why did I do this? I didn't do this project for me, although I did learn a great deal. I did this project because I wanted to stop and think about what's going on. You see, every day, we pass by things overlooking the beauty and, and in intricacy, like music. We underappreciate things and just accept them for just anything else. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that I hadn't thought much about sound. Well, now that I have, it's opened my mind up to observe things in different ways and always keep an open mind to things that may happen. So, what is music? I could have stood up here and lectured you all about the physics and math behind it, explaining that music is a complex set of waveforms uh, strung together to create certain sounds. But why would you want to listen to that? <laughs> Anyways, I think that we all know that music is something a little bit more than what lies behind it. Before I end, I'd like to thank some people. There's a quote by Isaac Newton that goes, if I see further, it's because I stand, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. This relates to my project because I feel that's the way that this whole year has gone for me, standing on the minds of Christian McInnes, my faculty advisor, and Rob Bailey, my external advisor. Without your guys' help, this wouldn't have been possible. I'd also like to thank my parents and my, the rest of my family for supporting me through this, and especially my brother saying, don't you have a master to be doing? <laughs> And finally, I'd like, you all, I'd like to thank you all for coming out and listening to my presentation. Uh, Mr. Ryan Cole has completed all the requirements for the Masterworks program at Iron City.